scare people. If you, uh, I mean, Crowley writes in the scathing, scathing critiques of these kind of guys at the time. Because uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Billy Sunday or no. what he wrote about that. Um, this guy was like an ex-baseball player who was really big in the States. He was like the Pat Robertson of his day and age. This ex-baseball player who come around and uh, just have all the, just do this revival of stuff. Like he'd tell all the women to put their knees together and then he'd scream, the gates of hell are closed. And stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that. That's the one that I remember, but he has a bunch of them. Curly wrote quite a bit about him. There's a, a, few other, um, a few other writers... Actually, one of my favorite fiction writer, P.G. Woodhouse, has sort of a send-up of him as well. Oh, it was Billy Monday in his story, but, yeah. It's kind of, it's amusing, amusing stuff. But, um, yeah, uh, Jonathan Edwards was kind of like the guy who came up with the whole, let's go around and just terrify people, as opposed to, like, Milton is writing for someone who's, like, educated and right. knows what's going on and can appreciate literature and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah, that would be the distinction I would make there. Okay. Yeah, I don't know, how are we doing for time here? It's been about an hour. I think it's good enough to do discussion time because I uh, I get sick of listening to myself talk. So how old was um, Elephus Levi? He just went into the priesthood in his earlier life and he um, got into, he was exposed to magic through uh, Rosicrucianism? Uh, we don't know, don't know exactly how he was exposed to magic. It was most likely because, as I said, um, priests were, like, selling favors and stuff like that. The, the whole thing was that if you were ordained as a Catholic priest, you could have the communion wafer. And that was considered to be a, a source of great magical power. Mm -hmm. um, even before the revolution, they, you would have aristocrats paying priests off to, like, do, like, destruction rituals on their aristocratic enemies by, uh, invoking the devil and burning the wafer and stuff like that. Like this was, There was a huge current of Satanism in French Catholicism that was happening uh, for many years before that. And simply by, because um, all the property was taken away and the ability to tithe was taken away, essentially the, the, uh, the French priesthood lost all its money. So you just had a huge upshot of this. So whoever could still afford to do stuff like that was doing stuff like that. So I imagine, and especially... I mean, this was 20 years before uh, Levy was born, and I, he was pretty young. I think he was about, I think, look, he was studying seminary, obviously, when he would be, like, probably, like, 16, 17, I believe, if I have that correctly. Um, and I think that he left when he was, like, 20, 21. Again, I'm not, I'm not exactly ironclad sure on that. But, um, yeah, like, there would have been a lot of occult activity happening at the time just because the priesthood was in such dire straits. And they, they couldn't rely on their normal sources of income, so that's kind of what they would do. So within the priesthood. So how does that relate to um, Catherine Deshay and that group? Like, um, what was the progression of time? So Oliphus Levi was about, um, he was after this, right? Uh, he was um, he was 65 and he died in 1870, so... Oh, okay, yeah. so, we, so yeah, it's quite a bit further. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is more like the Francis Dashwood sort of era. And yeah, like you, and you know, you had a lot of uh, a lot of like problems with the priesthood. And, and Levy's kind of interesting, and he's like the one of the few people like you can read people who are writing around his time that were really critical of the revolution, and you can read people who are really critical of the priesthood. He was kind of the only person who was critical of both of them. He's kind of like you both suck, which is why it's kind of interesting to see that. And part of the reason I think he was such an influence on Crowley because Crowley was a lot like that as well. He was a huge social critic. Um, and this is what brings me to like sort of my initial point when I was talking about you know in our culture like we can't criticize democracy, mm -hmm. it's not considered to be acceptable. But realistically speaking, look what it's doing. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of having a pretty negative effect, and that that um, which is very strongly on the point of what I was saying about the the great devils, how their purpose and the purpose of evil in the world essentially is to suck meaning out of people's lives mm -hmm. because people are horrible when they don't have meaning in their lives. Uh, one of my favorite uh, quotes from Nietzsche is because um, Aquinas, who came up with this outer darkness idea, very famously said, you know, to, in order to be happy, first you must be good. And Nietzsche was like, that's bullshit. In order to be good, first you must be happy. <laughs> like, happy people are great to be around. They're nice to everyone. They, they don't have to try to, you know, like, it's so funny about when people use the word tolerance. It's so good to be tolerant. It's like, that's 
such a weird term because it's like, oh yeah, you know, I saw Ed the other day, I totally tolerated him. I tolerated the hell out of that guy. It's sort of got a negative connotation to it already because the idea is you don't have to tolerate things that you like. You don't have to tolerate people that you like. That's not where it, you, to, you only have to tolerate things that you don't like. That's the underlying purpose. Well, there's a kind of paradox with adversity, actually, as a concept, because, like, in certain ways, if you go through a lot of bad stuff, it helps a person build character, but then, like, people from um, poor families or have gone through a lot of stuff also turn to crime. So well, it's yeah, like, it, it sort of, it sort of depends, I think. I think, like, it yeah. depends on the nature of the adversity and how people deal with it. I mean, how people deal with adversity is the ultimate judge of their character, right? Yeah. I mean, and I'm not going to uh, name this person specifically, but I... Let's just say that I'm, I'm close to this particular person who was always kind of like a bubblehead and kind of ditzy, kind of, never, I never really could make a connection to. And they went through a pretty messy divorce and, and there was custody issues and whatnot with the children. And after that, the next time I talked to that person, they were fascinating to talk to. They were very interesting. They were like, they had their life together and everything, but it was like after... Having that experience, suddenly they gained something in terms of like knowing about the world and knowing about how to interact with other people. When Crowley um, had his initiation, like the way that the AA system works is like the second highest grade is Magus. And when he did the Libra 418 stuff that we were talking about before is where he got initiated into the grade before that or Master of the Temple. He talks about his initiation to the grade of Magus as being essentially like one of the hardest times of his life because he felt that to identify with everyone, he had to go through everything. So he had to experience, he extreme, experienced like extremes of wealth and poverty, extremes of, you know, like alienation, and then other also being like in high society and stuff like that. Like, it went right back and forth very severely. And he said that this was because he had to know what everyone was going through to be able to, you know, experience all human interactions. Unfortunately, we don't know much this, much about this when it comes to Levy. Um, I would not be surprised to hear that there was something similar going on, but because really, as far as I can tell, as far as, and this is, it's fucking tragic, but there is no like biography of him out there. There's no real good study of this guy, simply because there isn't a lot, which is really kind of weird, because with most of the people who are like key into magical history, there are biographies and studies, and people write books about them and stuff like that. Um, but as far as I can tell, he made his living just through writing and um, lecturing on the Kabbalah. Um, maybe he had another job. He came from a very poor family. Like he, his father was a shoemaker, you know. So, which kind of meant it was, which it could possibly be one of the reasons that he was trying to join the seminary. But in previous times, you would think that. But at the time, the church had no money, so it, it doesn't even make sense there. It's interesting that he went to jail um, for writing and, and oh, yeah, well, like well, a lot of key historical figures, so like um, John Dean also spent time in prison. Well, John Dean didn't do time because he he went and pleaded his case and got off, but oh, he was accused. He was, I thought he was in prison. Does that sort of threaten or mm. like, Did he have a connection with the alchemical tradition? Uh, he writes about alchemy. Um, it's, it's hard to say what he actually has a connection with just because of what I was saying before about how we don't really have a distinct... I think that Waite, as much as um, I don't like Waite, as I think he has a point where you can see a shift in Levy's writing where he's, saying, he's talking about a lot of things that you consider mystical secrets, and he particularly... And, you know, uh, 